presentation of dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I feel a great sense of responsibility, but also gratefulness that I am the first person to see all these images. Coming up, he brings to life people's lost memories, and in doing so, reveals something about all of us. I talk with Levi Betweiser of the Rescued Film Project, next on Dialogue. Stay tuned. I got it from East Chicago, Indiana. 66 bundles of film. Many bundles contain over 30 rolls. I estimate there are about 1,200 rolls of film. 1,200 rolls of film shot by the same photographer in the 1950s. Never processed. His name was Paul. Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Marcia Franklin. You were just listening to a clip about one of the many mysteries my guest today has taken upon himself to try and solve. Like many photographers, Boise and Levi Betweiser loves to troll thrift stores looking for old cameras. He noticed that many had undeveloped rolls of film in them. So one day a few years ago, he decided to develop those rolls. The first images weren't particularly unique. A couple doing a puzzle, friends roasting marshmallows, the excitement and silliness of a baby shower. But they had been special to someone, special enough that they'd been preserved on film. So Betweezer wanted to find the owners if he could. He began posting the photos online. And what started as a hobby became, by his own admission, a bit of an addiction. Tens of thousands of negatives later, the positive result is the Rescued Film Project. And here to tell us more is Levi Betweezer. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here. And we've got a couple of your wonderful old cameras behind you that folks will be seeing. Well, first off, congratulations. This has really taken off in a big way. You've been doing it for a couple of years. And we should say that it's a labor of love. This is not your job. This is still a hobby. You yeah. do have a job. You work in the same industry that, that we do. You work in uh, video production. This is, this is a hobby. Yeah, yeah, I work a full-time job. I'm, I'm a video producer, but I spend as much time uh, in the mornings before I go to work and when I come home from work working on a rescued film. You know, I'll get up a couple hours early and I'll either scan film or, or edit photos. And uh, yeah, it's, it's honestly, it's been a bit of an obsession and I've had to learn how to kind of balance it with the rest of my life. Well, we'll get into it in just a moment. But first of all, when you were growing up, were photographs a big part of your life? Have you always loved photography? My mother was a photographer when I was growing up, and I just always remember growing up around cameras, and if we weren't her models for shoots to just go out and, and photograph us, we were always around it, and I actually remember actively uh, participating in like photo contests, shooting on old 35 millimeter film cameras when I was in elementary school. And then my dad, he was always walking around with a video camera, and so I think my, my parents were always documenting things around us, and, and I didn't realize it when I first started the project, but I really do think that has been ingrained in me from an early age. So, as I mentioned in my introduction, originally you were um, looking for old cameras in these thrift stores. But you would open them up and you'd find these uh, uh, undeveloped rolls of film yeah. in them. And one day you decided to develop them. And what was it about the images that you saw? Because as I mentioned, there's some of them pretty mundane uh, that made you want to, A, go out and find the owners, and B, continue with this and continue finding undeveloped rolls of film to process. Yeah, well I started looking at these images that were kind of intimate moments and special moments in people's lives and seemingly small moments in people's lives. But then I started connecting to them with myself as well and thinking about my own childhood memories and how much I cherish my own personal family photos. And there are some images that remind me of those moments for myself and so I realized that if I felt this connection to the images that I had when I was a kid, 
other people might want um, to see their images as well because seemingly unspecial moments to outsiders could be something extremely important mm -hmm. to the people who are within the photos. So you put some of them, you put them out on Instagram. People can follow you on Instagram, on, on Facebook. And you did actually reunite uh, one family with a photo. Yeah, so after I started the project, maybe about six months after I made it public, um, on our Instagram account, we posted a photo of an image of a man holding a dog. And then someone said, hey, that's my dad. And so um, we said, hey, message us. We sent her, it was a girl from Portland. We sent her all the images from that role. And it ended up being that there were photos of her getting a dog as a present from her family, and it was just photos of that. And she was just extremely excited and elated to see these photos. She was curious as to where we got the camera and the film, and we actually bought the camera here uh, in Boise in a thrift store. But in the main, and I think you have more than 16,000 uh, photos in your archive now, I in the main, while cr crowdsourcing helps you sometimes find where a picture was taken. Mm -hmm. You haven't uh, really connected people with their lost uh, roles except for that one. No. That's interesting to me. With social media, you'd think more would have been connected up. Yeah, and our social media reach is actually pretty far right now, and, and that's really what we rely on to reconnect these photos. Is since I have so little time to do the research, I've got to focus on the actual scanning and processing. But yeah, it, um, we've only connected that one to an orphaned role of film so far, but I mean, that is the goal of the project, though, is to inevitably reconnect these images with the people they belong to. But in addition, you're out there buying up rolls of film that you see online that are either, what, uh, being sold at auction or just being sold yeah. flat out. Uh, why is it that you're also using your own money <laughs> to purchase rolls like the 1,200 rolls that we saw in that clip at the top of the program? Yeah, well, I noticed that I can only find so many rolls of film just here in Boise, right, searching around and going to thrift stores. And honestly, since I've started doing that, I've noticed that the film cameras are less and less, so there's even less around. So I wanted to create an archive that was the biggest resource for people to go to find these kinds of images, and so I just started broadening my search. And I found that there's no better way to get rolls of film than just straight buy them and to establish relationships with camera dealers around the country and around the world and tell them, hey, if you find rolls of film, save them up for me. I'll buy them off you. And so it's just expanded and grown and grown and grown. And it just, I get rolls of film that I've purchased on my doorstep nearly every day. And it's, it's pretty incredible. How much money do you spend on these? I don't want to know. <laughs> you, <laughs> <It's> <laughs> well, let's talk about the 1,200 rolls in, yeah. in, of the Paul project that yeah. we saw up top. Were those expensive? Um, it did get a little expensive. Yeah, I bought those at an auction. And it, all the 1,200 rolls, it was put in multiple auctions. And I thought I was done after about two or three auctions. I was like, great, I got, I got it all. But then more kept coming. And I was like, well, I can't not have the entire collection. That would just be a tragedy if this, this collection got split up. And so I was kind of stuck, to be honest. And yeah, it got pretty expensive, but <laughs> it's worth it. Well, it is really fascinating. Let's talk about this Paul project. Yeah. Um, it, First of all, the way that they came, they were wrapped and wrapped and wrapped again and in cigar boxes that were wrapped again. And it took kind of a little army of people to unwrap all these things. Why do you suppose they were all wrapped up like this? And again, they were taken in the 1950s, right? In a pretty short period of time. Yeah, it was about a four year period um, that the, all the images were taken. And I'm assuming it's 1,200 rolls. We actually haven't unpackaged all of them, <laughs> but just doing math and based on what we've opened so far, we think it's about 1,200 rolls. But um, I've actually purchased them from the family, so I've been able to learn a little bit about the photographer. His name was Paul, and from what I understand, he was just a very, very meticulous person. He journaled extensively, and so I think it was partly that nature of him, but then also that they couldn't afford to actually get the film processed. So he really wanted to preserve them in a way that could be processed later, and he cataloged them extensively so that he could then get, know exactly what they were from since there were so many that were unprocessed. And I think that's, I think that's really the mindset uh, behind it. The family could have just looked at these things that had been sitting there, because he, he died pretty early, mm -hmm. as I understand it, in his life, um, and thrown them away. But they, they obviously wanted them preserved, didn't they? Yeah, you know, I think, and I hear that all the time when I start talking about the Rescued Film Project with people, is people say, I've had this roll of film that's just gone with me from house to house to house, junk drawer to junk drawer to junk drawer, and they just keep holding on to it. And they don't really know why, but I think they, subconsciously, they realize that it's important. Like, what's on there is important, and they shouldn't throw it away. And I think that's, 
that happens universally with film, and I think the same thing is true with the Paul film. Well, let's talk about what some of the photos. Um, right now, people can see uh, on our set uh, an enlargement of one of them. It is, I think, a wonderful photo of three girls kind of vamping in their cute dresses. I don't know if they're Easter dresses or, or what they are. They're Sunday best. Yeah. And this is typical of the kind of photos that, are, uh, that Paul took. Um, Americana from Indiana, right? Yeah. Um, scenes. He photographed his scenes uh, every day, his family, and then street scenes like this. Yeah, it's pretty incredible looking through all the photos. They are 99.9%, .9%, the ones we've processed so far, are of his children uh, or people who are interacting with his children in or around his home. That's primarily what I've seen. And so many of them are taken right outside the front door on the front sidewalk. And it he seems like as people would walk by, he would capture these moments as well, which is kind of what this photo is from. He was probably taking a photo of his kids playing on the sidewalk and these girls were walking by. Maybe they're friends with one of his daughters and it's, it's really cool, cool to see these, these types of images. Well, you mentioned his daughter. Uh, how does she feel about you being the one that's developing these and putting them online? Yeah, well, when I first reached out to the person who sold me the film, I asked them to put me in contact with the family and then when I reached out to her, I had to kind of educate her on, on who I was and what I was doing a little bit. Um, and once she realized what the Rescue Film Project was, I think honestly it was a little sigh of relief because even though they had to end up selling the, the film, they still knew it was important and I think they feel now that it's, it's in the right hands and they love looking through the images and they've expressed to me that they had a great childhood and they love their parents very much and, and it's uh, really incredible to kind of look back on these images that they've never seen before. Well, uh, he also took pictures of his son and uh, there's one that I just love where, the, and it's, to me it looks actually like a professionally mm -hmm. done photograph where the boy is wearing a little party hat and has a balloon yeah. and standing in his underwear. It might maybe it's his birthday day, I don't know what. Yeah. It's absolutely adorable. Well, Paul, the photographer, was a really talented hobbyist and he was very meticulous and he would write on every single roll the type of film he shot it on, the type of camera he shot it on, and any, any kind of lighting he used. And so he wasn't a professional photographer, he actually worked for a steel mill, but he was a very talented hobbyist and he was obviously very um, interested in documenting his family's life. If you could talk to him today, what would you ask him? Oh man, um, well the first question I would have is really really what was the mindset behind all the packaging? Because I think, I think I understand it, but I don't really know. Like it was very, very, very meticulous. But then I would want to know why he took so many photos of his children the way he took the photos of his children in these rolls, it literally looked like he would just take an entire roll and shoot 12 images back to back to back to back of the scene. So it's his kids playing in the pool. It's 12 images that almost look like stop motion of them playing in the pool. And so I, didn't, I would like to know if his goal was to shoot a roll a day of each of his children. And if so, was it just a, a kind of a chore at some point if he was literally just flying through them that mm -hmm. fast? That would probably my, be my number one question. Is, was this more of a burden or did you actually enjoy doing this? And I was speaking to his daughter Annie, he, she did mention that he just really had an interest in preserving history and he would tell the kids like, you're gonna wanna see these photos one day. And, um, and so yeah, I just think he just really loved his family and he, he really wanted to have these moments for them to remember when they grew up. The perspective of them, some of them is so interesting, direct to camera. You know, the way they're taken. Direct to camera, a lot of low level, because a lot of the cameras were shot from a waist level camera. You know, hold it down here and you look into it. And uh, yeah, they're just these iconic Americana 1950s photos. One of the things I do like about these photos as well is that they are Americana. You can see changes, trends. Uh, for instance, there are some black uh, children in some of the photos, so we know it was an integrated neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And there are some photos taken in suburbia, what I would call exurbia actually, where you can see the line demarcation between suburbia and farm fields. Yeah. So you can see the developing America as well. There's, e there's even one where the kids are peering into a store that advertises itself as being cool inside because it has air conditioning. Yep. So uh, these photos are preserving not only personal lives, but uh, slices of our country as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's photography in general, right? I mean, people don't realize that, yeah, as they're taking photos of themselves, they're also helping document our collective history as human beings and where we go and where we travel to. And these photos have more importance when you think about them like that. When you're like, oh, it's just a photo of a kid on the street or a kid in the zoo, but it really does tell a greater story to what we do and who we are as human beings. Now, um, 
while many of the photos that you purchase are black and white and have some historical significance, most of them that you find, you know, in roles are color. Mm -hmm. And what fun images, you know, lots of themes in here, like lots of birthday cakes, yeah, lots, right? Lots of cats, lots of dogs, lots of birthday cakes. I mean, people have been documenting the same things since the beginning of consumer photography that they do now, right? Birthdays party, birthday parties, dogs, cats, Thanksgivings, vacations. It's all the same stuff. Um, it's just watching them go through the errors is really interesting. Yeah. And some of them are a little risque, too. We get a little bit of that, yeah. Uh, anything that we feel like is a little too risky, uh, we, I don't even scan in those types of things, so I don't want people to think, feel like this isn't some kind of invasion of their privacy. But yeah, um, anything you can imagine people take photos of, um, to an extent, we have probably come across it. Color is not very stable, though, is it? We all know that from maybe waiting too long to develop our own rolls of color film. Yeah. Light see, seem to seep in, and the color films, early color roll films seem to degrade. That's true. I mean, color, film manufacturing, I mean, earlier black and white film was better manufactured than later color film, partly because there's a lot more silver in it, but also because color film uses more things like dyes as that are less stable than like a silver halide base. So yeah, I actually oftentimes get better images of 1950s and 60s rolls of black and white than I do 80s and 90s rolls of color. Some of the black and white film that you process is so old that it has degraded. Um, despite Paul's best efforts, you know, the, the film might have been in a place that was too hot or too cold or a little bit moldy. Mm -hmm. But those images to me are really some of the most interesting. I love one of a girl on a clothesline, I assume his daughter again. And what an imp again, she's got her nice dress on and she, yeah. I can just hear the mother going, why are you on the clothesline? But what's interesting about this photo is it's degraded, but it gives it this quality, yeah. this ephemeral quality that's very poignant to me. Well, and it's, and that's kind of what I love about it. I get a lot of questions and people reach out and they say, hey, do you need help retouching all these photos and, and, and fixing them? You know, I hear that a lot, fixing them. And I, I say, uh, I appreciate it, but really the degradations that, these film na that this film now has tells a greater story to what the role of film has been through. And then it has transformed the image beyond what the photographer originally intended it into now maybe more of a piece of art. And when you see these streaks of mold or light leaks or anything that has uh, been on the film as a result of the 50 to 60 to 70 years it's taken to get to me, I think that's just as important as the image itself. There's one you have that's extraordinary to me. It's not part of the Paul series, but it's a, a man and a child fishing. Yeah. And has become like a painting. It does. I mean, I've posted that one before, and it does, people think it's a pencil drawing. And uh, the funny thing about that is I actually almost threw that negative away. But I've learned that through the digital scanning process that I pretty much scan everything in, even if I don't see a discernible image, because once you get it in digitally, you can really pull out some of those, some of those like hidden images that are in those negatives. Let's talk about the processing itself. Yeah. Um, you do this in your spare time on weekends, whatever. You can't just kind of make a huge batch process. These are individually processed uh, rolls because each one was. Uh, preserved differently, uh, had different challenges with each each role. Yeah. Um, so it takes some time, doesn't it, to go through this whole development process? Yeah, I mean, film developing in itself is a very kind of slow, meticulous process, but then when I have to take into account that I might be working with on a particular day, even if I'm doing black and white, five to eight different types, emulsion types of film that all require their own different development times, and some may be a little bit more degraded, and it's it's a little unnerving, it's a little, it makes me a little anxious when I, I, I have to kind of guess a little bit. You get good at it and, and you, I get familiar with certain types of film, but yeah, I'll start in the morning processing around 7 a.m. and I'll, I won't stop sometimes until 7, 8 or 9 at, that following evening just processing all day. And I can process anywhere from 80 to 150 rolls in a day. What is it like when you finish all this hard work and you hold these up to the light or you look at them on a scanner what is that like, seeing these images come to life? It's, I feel a great sense of responsibility, but also gratefulness that I am the first person to see most of these images, or all of these images. When I, you know, 
process a batch, and after a half an hour, I get to pull it open, uh, the tank open, and hold these negatives up to the light for the very first time, and realizing this is the first time in maybe 50 years that that film has seen light, and then I can actually see the images that not even the photographer has seen, it does make me very humble, but then I also feel the great sense of responsibility to make sure that I take care of that image. Well, let's talk about some of the photos that um, you really, really enjoy, some that you've picked out for our viewers to concentrate on. One is fun. People from Idaho will recognize the location. It's Zim's Hot Springs, and these are photos that were taken, obviously, on an underwater camera. Yeah, that was actually an image that I got from the very first batch I did for the Rescued Film Project, which made me want to actually create the Rescued Film Project. And it's an entire roll, 35, 36 pictures from a 35 millimeter underwater camera, and it's just all these images of these two boys taking turns going back and forth, taking uh, photos of each other under the water. And I love it both because of the imagery, but also because it's from Idaho, um, obviously where I'm from. And I wish I had more of images from Idaho, but yeah, I love those images. Some are really mysterious. Uh, there's one of a man, African-American man, just sitting in a car looking rather dejected. There's somebody else in his car. I don't know whether he's had a crash or whether it's a scene from a film in which there was a crash. It definitely looks like it could be a scene from a film. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, a lot of these are extremely mysterious. They have a mysterious quality to them. Well, I think that's part of the fun of the project, too, is trying to tell the stories that are around that one image. Sometimes you only have one picture to try and tell the entire story of a scene or of a person. And that image in particular, I've looked at it many times, it definitely is from a car crash. The man is sitting there looking a little distraught. He's actually exhaling a, a cigarette smoke. You can see it coming out of his mouth. And you can actually see the silhouette of a man sitting in the back of his car with a hat facing away from him, and it's got a roll cage in the car. So the car itself probably was in an accident because of some kind of drag race. But that's just what you infer from looking at the photo. It doesn't necessarily mean that's what actually happened. Now, you've made a card, a, a, a greeting card of this next series of images, they're fascinating. Somebody, maybe in Britain, because that's where you purchased them, yep. took pictures of the Apollo capsule landing, but also waiting for the Apollo capsule to land. Just mm -hmm. kind of the uh, nervousness of not knowing what was going on as we were waiting for that Apollo 13 capsule. Yeah, it's basically the entire scene of the Apollo 13 landing, from what I understand, and every moment that there's a there's a photo of someone's television of the Apollo 13 coming, and one of them, yeah, is waiting to hear. Uh, another one is after the, uh, the capsule actually landed. And yeah, I got that, that photo from a roll that I bought in the UK. And think about it, before there was TiVo or Facebook or anything like that, I mean, how did you document an historic moment like that? You took a picture of your television, so. You have another one um, that's militarily related that I really like. It's, it's this man, probably a cook or something, in a stark white uniform on a boat looking towards the camera. Yeah, that image, I really love it because the man in the white, who already stands out, is looking directly into the camera. And for whatever reason, the camera is on the exact same level that he is. It's high up, looking down on the crowd, and uh, that was just a striking photo. So is this a race against time? Is roll film degrading, and is that part of the impetus for why you're doing this? Yeah, I think roll film is kind of at a very interesting point where now it's more seen as an art medium and, and people are using it for really high quality purposes. They're not using it for their day-to-day -day moments. So I think that the film that was out there that was shot for those day-to-day -day moments is definitely going away and is definitely degrading every day. And so I am desperately <laughs> trying to get as much of it as possible to put in the archives so that people have one resource to go to so that they can search and research the images. Ultimately, what would you like to come out of the rescued film project? The ultimate goal of the project is to reconnect the images with the people that they belong to or are connected with them in some way, whether it's a family member or a friend of the photographer. To do that, I would like to have a great website, web-based platform where people can go on and search and even add their own research to it, because as we've talked about a lot, my big, the biggest tool to relocating these images and, and and connecting them with people is to crowdsource it and get as many people's eyeballs on them as possible. What have you learned about why people took pictures then versus why we take pictures now or how we take pictures now? What are some mm. of your thoughts on the changes? You've looked at thousands and thousands of photos now. Mm -hmm. I think people still take, primarily take pictures of the same kinds of things that they used to overall. Um, but I think when you only have nine chances 
you think a little bit more about what you're going to capture and if it's really worth taking a picture of it. And now I feel that with the extreme accessibility with digital photography, that people take it a little bit for granted a little bit and they, they don't stop to think, is this image worth creating? Is this a moment that I feel like I should leave behind? Now, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. I personally, even as a photographer, I take very little photos on vacations and things like that just because I'd rather be in the moment than trying to create a moment for a photo. I feel like people oftentimes, more now than ever, are, are creating moments that will make a great photo as opposed to going out and having experiences and documenting them with the photo. Um, and so when I go out personally, I'd rather be in the moment than have to fumble with the camera and take a photo and then take another one because someone blinked and then take another one because someone looked weird and then take another one and then take, and it takes you out of the moment. Personally, that's how I feel. Do you want to monetize this at all? Do you want to sell any of these photos? Because I know the people who, who um, give you photos sign rights yeah. away. Yeah. Um, what would you like to do in that respect? I, I really only want to monetize the project enough to where it's self-sustaining. Um, and that's really it. I want to raise enough funds to be able to uh, purchase the film, purchase the chemicals, and, cre and run whatever platform I'm going to put the project on. So that could take the form of? Website, it could also be art galleries, installments, things like that. Whatever can get the images in front of, in front of as many people as possible is, is really what I'm looking for. And uh, people can go to your Instagram page, your website to figure out uh, about donations. Are there things that you won't accept, Levi? Well, yeah, since this is the Rescued Film Project and it's an archive, and I'm, I am asking people when they donate the rolls of film that they sign over copyright to the project as well of any images we get. It's not a film processing service. I don't process images that someone shot three years ago and they just forgot to get it developed. I try and filter those out when people send them and there's a little comment section on my donation form like where, where are these, where's this film from? Because um, that's not in the true spirit of rescuing film. Um, so when that happens, I just refer them to really great paid processing services. What's been the best part of this project the last couple years for you? Honestly, the best part for me Initially, the best part for me was being able to be the first person to see these images, and that's what kind of really lit my fire every time I do this. But outside of that, it's really been seeing other people's interest in the project. And I honestly didn't r know how people were going to react to the project when I made it public. I was a little worried, to be honest. But just to see the overwhelming amount of support and interest and intrigue by what I'm doing, that has been my favorite part so far. Is, is to, it's kind of validating to know that all this time and all this effort, people appreciate it and they love looking at these images and they also feel that what I'm doing is important. Well, thank you. Thanks for taking the time to talk with me and our viewers about what you're doing. And best of luck to you. I certainly will be following along to see some of the more great images that you're putting out there. Yeah, thank you. No, I appreciate it. This was really fun. Well, that's unfortunately all the time we have. You've been listening to Levi Betweezer, the Rescued Film Project in Boise. For more information, check out the Dialogue website. Just go to idahoptv.org and click on Dialogue. For Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin. Thanks for tuning in. presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Check out our website, become a friend on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter.